It's time to take command with former NFL tight end Logan Paulson and former Commander's Beat reporter Craig Hoffman. What's up? It's the Take Command Podcast. Craig Hoffman here, Logan Paulson there, and rookie minicamp is done. Real minicamp, if you will, veteran minicamp, voluntary minicamp, the one where the whole team's there. Uh, is starting uh, as we're recording this today on Monday, open to the media tomorrow, Tuesday, where many of you are hearing this. So we will react to that later in the week. Right now, though, Logan, on today's show, first impressions of the rookies, especially, of course, of Jaden Daniels. You finally got to see him in person, throwing, operating in a number five in burgundy and gold. Salute to Tress Way. Uh, and then we will get into the second rounder, Johnny Newton, the injury news there. And uh, Logan, to wrap up the show today, a little bit of fun uh, to to use your NFL brain, your 10 years of playing experience, uh, and dive into a, kind of what's become a fun little viral trend over the weekend. Mm. Dan Orlovsky uh, put out just, hey, this is what an install looks like. This is what just like the basics looks like. And Chase Daniel was like, okay, Dan took care of that part. Let me show you what a, a play looks like in the NFL. So we're going to dive into just how hard it is to learn these playbooks for these rookies and lean on your experience there to end the show. But let's start off with rookie minicamp, Logan. What's the, when you walked out of that practice on Friday, the open practice to the media, like what's the thing that, that stuck with you? I was pretty juiced, man. I think the, the, the main thing I think people have been talking about, I've heard people talk about it, just the energy in the building and at the practice. Um, obviously Dan made that a point of emphasis, getting all those guys out there running around and um, you know, they do, they start the, the, the the period that the practice off after warm up with that bag drill the competitive drill get everybody running through there and I remember doing stuff like that when I was in Atlanta with him and I know that's something he did in Seattle I know that's a Pete Carroll thing uh, I know they did it at USC I remember going to camps when I was in college and that was a big thing at USC so it's been around for a while but I love just kind of how the guys the building you know the building responded to it the coaches brought a ton of juice Cliff Kingsbury's running around yelling at people David Rye the tight end coach has got juice like Everybody was was ready to rock and roll. The reporters were juiced after it, so it definitely felt like a new, um, <clears throat> like a new, a new era, which it obviously is. But it was nice to kind of get that first practice under your belt and just kind of see see the difference already, just in terms of energy and approach. And I think so. Outside of the energy, obviously, I think the next thing would be Jaden Daniels and just how sharp and crisp he looked. Well, we can get into Jaden in a second, but like if the reporters are juiced, like we're we gonna get we're we gonna get Kaim and Fortier running through those bags. Is Nikki gonna take out a coach just running through? Uh, yeah, I mean, well, like, I think the thing was, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I just think it was like the you just see the smiles, the smiles, the energy, kind of like everybody's up. You know, I was doing the live stream with the commanders on their show, the yeah. was the command center show, and you know, Fred is like he's like can barely contain himself which is even you know for fred is not that unusual but he's ready to go tan is like all kind of pot it it brought me back man a little bit to like playing you know and what's fun about it and like the nervous energy before a practice like this and and getting it out in that kind of moment so it was um yeah definitely the energy was was, was full there. and i do think the report like I, I could see it they were like laughing and excited and engaged with the practice in a way that i haven't seen them engaged you know in a couple of years for for a multitude of reasons so yeah, no doubt. Uh, excited to get out there. I was out of town this weekend, but I'm going to try to make it out to, to some of the off season starting uh, tomorrow. So again, we'll have a reaction from all of that from the both of us um, coming up later in the week. But uh, for Jaden, like this is the first time you get to see him throw in person, uh, you've watched so much tape of, of him. What's it like to watch him perform in person, the release kind of some of the, the, I saw some of the the clips, obviously the way he can layer throw some of the bombs he mm. throws, like there's just certain guys when they throw a deep ball, especially where you're like, Oh, that's different. Like you just, you yeah. understand that, get it up to get it down type of stuff, but getting to see the release and, and all that kind of stuff in person and him in a uniform, like what was your first impression? Yeah, I mean, you mentioned the uh, the uniform thing. I just got to touch on that. I think it's really cool that Trust did that. I know that was like a really emotional thing for him to get that done. And so, you know, I know they have like kind of some type of, you know, business arrangement around the number change, but um, good for Trust. You know, that's why you're a captain. That's why he is who he is. And, you know, way to welcome Jaden Daniels to the organization and get him the number that he needs. So um, first off, that's really cool. The second, you know, kind of a more technical purview of him as a player, like, you know, obviously I'd watch a ton of film watch this pro day. And um, the thing that always kind of stood out to me is like, it seems like he has really good footwork. It seems like he's got a really tight release, but seeing it in person, like those things were like dialed to 11. 
And, you know, I've watched a lot of quarterbacks, watch a lot of quarterbacks for the draft, you know, watch a lot of NFL film every year, um, you know, obviously for, for the team. And I just was like, wow, like that is, you know, everyone talks about his athleticism, like that is something special. And so I think people say, why is, you know, why is a drop so special? Why is the quick release so special? And it just allowed him to get to stuff more comfortably. So for example, like in seven on seven, you know, they're working whatever concept they're working. They got a front side read, back side read, or it's a full field read, excuse me, full field read. So start on the right, work to your left. If a quarterback's got bad feet, there's like this deliberate hitch to get to the backside stuff. His feet were so quick, he could tempo out, get to the top of his drop, and then kind of accelerate his feet to get to the backside stuff, which was great, I thought. And I, so not only does that show a great physical ability, but it shows to my eye, in my understanding, a great understanding of the offense already. You know, like they've already got some hand signals in. He understands the reads. I mean, for a first day, seven on seven, you know, usually there's guys not on the same page. They're running the wrong routes. The ball sails. The timing's off. They're getting to the check down late. He's patting the football. And there was none of that, you know, and I think that's a testament, A, to his physicality, like we talked about with the footwork but also to his ability to study and learn and just get guys on the same page, which, you know, get himself on this, get, get himself on the right page. Maybe is a better way to put that. Like, not like he's bringing people along. I have no insight on that, but he knew what the heck was going on in that practice. He knew what Cliff was looking for. And I, so I think both those things together, I come out of there being like that, that's a nice way to start your tenure as a Washington commander, commander, that, that footwork is definitely professional footwork. And after seeing it in person, I know we had a lot of conversation about Drake may, leading up to, um, you know, obviously the draft and, and even now, like that, that is maybe the biggest difference between the two players, the consistency of his feet and the quickness of his feet in those drops and his ability to get through progressions because of his feet. I, I mean, I knew it was good because I'd watched a lot of it, but seeing in person, that was a thing that, that I came away with being like, dang, like this could be, this could be special. It, it, again, it's so early. I don't want to anoint him. I'm not crowning anybody, but that was sure. a thought I had while watching. I thought Trevor put it so well in our last pod about like kind of the reason the NFL liked him so much in the repeatability thing. And like, that's yeah. exactly what you're talking about. The ability to like, okay, sure. Can Drake do the crazy, like off one foot, throw the ball 60 yards in the air thing? Yeah. But how often does that come up? Not very often. And how often can you do the basic stuff that comes up, snap in, snap out? Not as consistently as Jaden Daniels can. And that repeatability thing is so, so, so important. I think Trevor uh, nailed that. And, and I've been thinking about that a lot over the weekend as I kind of think about what I'm going to be looking for. And to hear that, I think, is cool. The other thing that I, I would also just add from like my years of covering games in person, especially... Um, as a reporter, is there were certain guys that I would I would watch warm ups and be like, oh, I get it. Yeah. And you know, the guy that the, I think the first guy that I really encountered like that was Jared Goff, um, where I was I watched Jared Goff warm up and I was just like, oh, that that why that's why he's the number one pick. The ball just <laughs> absolutely flies out of his hand. Yeah. And like it's just different. And I was covering Cousins, and like Kirk is obviously a really good quarterback, but he's not a special arm talent. He was never a guy that was going to be drafted in the top ten, right? And I watch golf and this is like my first year covering games on the road and all that kind of stuff. We're out at the LA Coliseum a year after Jared's the number one pick and you see the ball fly out of his hands. You're like, oh, duh. I remember watching Aaron Rodgers warm up before a preseason game. And you're like, oh, yeah, like the ball, right. it, it's a different, it, it, it's not the same sport. And I think that being able to see that in a quick release and a good mechanics and just making it kind of look easy and look professional yeah. is the kind of thing that you look for. And, and it also makes sense why as Dan and, and Cliff and Adam all got to go to the pro day and, and see him do all this stuff in person. They're like, yep. All right. Tape was great. Yeah. That's the, that's the thing that we're looking for. And, and lo and behold, he's the number two pick and uh, probably going to start, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens, you know, who gets the first reps this week, but it feels like he's more than in line to start uh, the season as, as, or the off season is QB one. And I would assume that carries on into the regular season. Yeah. And again, like he doesn't have, it's not like he's got this overwhelming arm, but it's the stuff that gets to the throw that I think I was really impressed with. And you mentioned the deep ball, like the deep ball accuracy was totally there. Like, and it's so effortless, right? He gets back and it's all like, it's all from a really consistent base. It's all from a really consistent timing. That ball is at his ear, like almost instantaneously and it's out. 
And, you know, I've played with guys with quick releases and it, and it gets you out of a lot of stuff being able to throw the football like that. They were, they were doing a drill in warmups with cliff where they were kind of like catching the snap and like acting like they're throwing like a now RPO. And I don't, you know, like I've seen a lot of quarterbacks, man. And like his ability to get his feet, get, catch the sketch, the snap, get the ball to his ear and turn his feet to the, to like the now throw. I mean, it's gotta be one of the fastest I've ever seen and I'm not being hyperbolic. And again, like the arm talent, there's some other stuff there that, you know, isn't like that, but like that is special. And like, if you can get that stuff done, get that footwork, it, and then watching him in the seven on seven, it just kind of reinforced that perspective. Cause it's like any, anything that I needed to do from a footwork standpoint, I could get there. Oh, I need to throw a five yard out. I can accelerate my feet because I got free access right now, but boom, it balls out. Oh, I got to like take a little bit longer. I'm trying to hit the, the high cross coming through. I'm going to like, let my eyes and my feet take me to the out. And then I'm going to re quickly reset and throw the high cross. And I just was like, Man, like that guy looks like he's been playing NFL quarterback for a while. And again, it's a truncated offense. It's simplistic, but it looks like he knows what to do. Like even getting to the check down, like that's another thing you watch with quarterbacks. You know, we talked about, I think we talked about evaluating uh, film and just like the footwork. Yes. And so like he's he's looking, it's dead. Good job by defense. I think the defense did a great job too. We'll talk about that in a second. Defense is dead. And instead of like pat, pat, it's like, I know it's dead in my drop. Boom. And then I'm going to reset real quick and hit the burst to the back. And I just was like, that's stuff that you love to see. Like that was something like last year with Sam Howell, for example, it always made me a little bit nervous. And we talked about it on the show is just his yeah. ability not to see kind of the defense is doing this. I'm anticipating this. The ball goes there. And it, in, in this, in this first seven on seven, which was like 10, 15 plays, you got to see that now as defenses get complicated, like obviously the test is going to get harder, but in terms of saying like, what should a first or a second, you know, the second pick in the draft, your first round quarterback look like? Like, I came away being like, this is going to be this good. This could be really cool. And again, yeah. it's still early, but it's it could be really cool. So. Yeah, the check down thing, I think, is, is such a great example of kind of the next level processing, because instead of having to go like one, two, three, four, check down, if you realize that one and two are dead and it, it's be, they're dead because the coverage is this and the concept right. that you ran was that, like you can skip three and four because you know they're also dead. Like you just, you ran a bad play sometimes uh, for mm -hmm. the coverage. And if you know that, you just get to the check down early and that's going to give the check down an extra yard or two of space. And a yard or two of space in the NFL is really hard to come by. And it also means you get from a, a like a bang, bang play on a check down to having a playmaker, typically running back, in space like that's really valuable and so the ability right. to get there quickly um and like kirk has always been great at that if you want the super deluxe version like brady was incredible at that to just yeah. realize like check down now skip trying to make a hero play or see if someone made a mistake on number read number four and just get to the check down and and we can make our playmakers or let our playmakers make a play um with that it is a truncated offense obviously this yeah. is kind of truncated day one defense install. too yeah, for sure. And so it, it's a chance to just kind of see how these guys can perform. I'm curious, like, before we get to the rest of the draft picks and anybody else, UDFAs, et cetera, that might have stuck out, from a coaching standpoint, watching Cliff coach, watching Joe Witt coach, um, and kind of seeing how they approach this from from Dan's view as the head coach, any early impressions on those guys as they're obviously also new, and this is our first impression of them? Obviously, I didn't get to see Witt, uh, you know, because the offense was kind of right smack dab in front of us. And so the defense was off to the left. And so you're trying to watch, but you're kind of looking through cameras and stuff and can't really see. But we got to watch Cliff very closely. Cliff and the receivers were kind of right in front of us. DBs, too. We'll talk about them in a second. But uh, I was, uh, you know, Cliff is a guy, I think you'd see it in his pressers, who's very, he's quiet. He's a very nice guy. He's a very smart guy, but, you know, not overly gregarious, not overly energetic in the building when he's walking around. He'll say hi to you, you know. Super great professional, all that kind of stuff. But seeing him on the field, man, he was juiced. Like he was juiced, the energy, the drop. And it I saw a couple just, of videos and I'm like, okay, Cliff with the quick feet, let's go. Yeah. It's exactly right. And then like his like there's certain times when you're when people are coaching where there's like a little there's like a distractedness to their eye. And again, it's the first day, so I'm sure he's locked in. But like with Sean McVay, like Sean is watching you every single rep. He's gonna have a point of feedback for you every single time. And I felt like Cliff was like that like that was kind of the vision i had of him on the quarterback and um and that, i think that's great it was unexpected and i love to see that i love to see kind of this this staff they all of them were, were all the guys i the defensive guys are they're yeah they're they're, they're not screaming but they're, they got energy right they're running to drills they're coaching guys up there and i just thought that is that that feels like what dan wants you know after you know after being with him in atlanta for a year and a half like 
he wants guys that are going to elevate not only you, they're going to help help get you through practice from an emotional standpoint. And I felt like that's what I was watching out there, which was great. Yeah. Um, I'm going to shout out my uh, my other co-host on my other podcast, Chris Gores, uh, real quick, just on the coaching thing. Because Chris is, uh, for those that have never watched the crossover episodes that we do on YouTube, uh, uh, Chris is like a five foot nine, five foot ten ish, like Filipino guy. He's now <laughs> dad of four, and is and he's forty now. But yeah. there's a, there's this thing that happens to Chris when he coach. He goes from this like unassuming, super laid back guy to like he does it, and you're just like, yeah. oh, like you were an athlete slash you are an athlete, and like you watch him turn on in that way. And I think that's like like I've always said for Chris, it's like his coaching superpower is the mm. ability to to get, create buy-in. And obviously that that's not the only way to do it. Like Pete Carroll, 70 years old. I guess Pete was out there still throwing balls. Uh, sure. But I don't think Belichick was out there running around. I don't think Saban's, he's only out there running around so much. But the ability for Cliff when working with Jaden specifically to still be like, if I needed to do this, not in a game, but like in a practice, like I can show you exactly what it's like. It's just, it's another tool in your coaching bag. And to watch Cliff kind of come alive in that way, not only from an energy, but from like a, an intensity and a, and an ability to demo the thing we've all taken yeah. a, you know, a class of some kind of physical nature, whether it's a fitness class or, you know, you're taking an art class in college, whatever. If the, if the teacher can show you the thing, the way it's supposed to be done, there is value in that. And so I thought that was really cool to see Cliff do that. And I'm sure that there's plenty of other coaches on staff who, uh, who can do that stuff as well. All right. Let's flip over to the defensive side of the ball. Anybody that, or anything that really stands out there as they get into the seven on seven, um, you know, any early kind of leanings on, on maybe what we're going to see schematically uh, or any of the personnel uh, that really stood out. Obviously with Johnny Newton, not out there. We'll talk about him in a second. Yeah. Um, so defensively, I think Mike Sanders still is a guy just from a footwork standpoint, from a competitive standpoint, again, it's one practice. So I'm not like trying to annoy anybody here, but you see, uh, again, like that's the cool thing. So I wanna, I'm going to regress here slightly for a second. But one of the cool things about Jaden Daniels is like he threw box fades and hitches a lot in college, right? And so you're like, can he do some of these other throws? And so I know it's a small sample size, but he did it, right? So like that was – I think that also adds to the excitement around him as a prospect and as a player here with Washington. But Mike Sanders, so I think with the other guys, it was cool to see them either check a box or answer a question. So Mike Sanders still, great feet, great ball instincts. There was some stuff where you can tell it's new to the defense. They ran a quick slant on him, and Fred Smoot standing next to me in my ear going, oh, he's got to break that up. Oh, I, you know, like his Fred is – he's an old head. He, they're, they're running simple offenses, so he can identify concepts pretty well and kind of – you can see what made Fred great. But, he, you know, Sanders still still figuring that out. And, again, it's the first day, but I think, like, you see the athlete, you see the intuition, you see the work ethic. So I think that's all good. And then – um McGee, Jordan McGee, man, he's big. He's a big old dude now. Like, and I know he's like, I think he weighs 225, but he's like got big arms. He's piped up. He's got a nice physicality to him. He's got a nice, nice athleticism to him. Dominique Hampton's big, man. He's a big, tall son of a gun. And they had him basically playing kind of like, you know, we'll see what happens, but kind of like that dime Sam, nickel Sam linebacker position. I know they don't have right. anybody there, everybody there at practice, but like, I think that's kind of the role we envisioned for him, that star. And again, he just looks looks the part. You know what I mean? Like he's just a big dude. Oh gosh, the cornerback from Arizona State. Um Anusium, is that his name? The the guy from Yeah. Yeah. Anusium. Yeah. yeah. He Chigozi Anusium. Like I walked out, he walked out of me in front of the building, like we were going from the studio to the field. And I was like, Who is this guy? And he's just tall, he's long, he's competitive, he's got good feet. And I know they don't have helmets on. They're not tackling right now. But seeing him move around, I was like, oh, this guy could I, – I, I could see why they made such a big deal to prioritize him in terms of making sure he was here. I'm trying to think if anybody else stood out. But those were kind of the big names off defensively that I kind of was like keeping an eye on that I thought were impressive, moved around well. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously Owens, the guy from uh, Texas Tech, is an absolute beast. He's huge. Like there was a point in time where it was like McGee, Dominique Hampton – Owens and they're all six four. They're all in that two fifteen to two thirty five range. They've all got long arms, all crazy explosive, and it just made the field look so small, relatively speaking. And I thought, man, they've got some really unique body types here for training camp. 
Yeah, no, for sure. Tyler Owens, the, uh, the Tyler safety Owens. that you're talking about. Yeah, I mean, it's it's funny because like you watch the uh, our crossover sports here on a football podcast uh, specifically, but like you watch the NBA playoffs right now, and you watch like Oklahoma City or you watch Minnesota. Um, some of these young, super athletic teams that have built themselves around length, and you realize how quickly this court just gets ridiculously small. It's that yeah. same thing just on a football field. Like in an era where offenses are trying to play basketball uh, on on offense, can you shrink the court space, in this case, field space, and extra length, extra bodies? It's just, it makes the windows that much tighter. It makes uh, the, the picture that much muddier for the quarterback. And um, I think Dan has certainly figured that out of like, how do we get size, length, athleticism on the field? And whether it's this kind of hybrid safety linebacker role or giving responsibilities to a traditional will linebacker that are a little bit different, like Dan and, and obviously with Joe Witt's help, uh, and now Joe in charge of the defense here uh, in Washington is, is figured out how to do that in Dallas. Um, on the offensive side, to go back, we talked about Jaden. Um, what about Sinnott? What about McCaffrey? Any, anybody else that, that stood out on the offensive side of the ball? Yeah, I think McCaffrey, like, you know, it's funny. You're watching me. He's, they're doing the receiver stuff, like, right in front of us. And he just – he reminded me so much of his dad and the way he ran routes, like this hard, aggressive snap down, the strength in the lower half, like the competitiveness at the catch point. And, you know, like, they're running a ton of cover three. It's day one install stuff. They're running a ton of, ton of, ton of Cut a, t- a ton of cover three. There we go. And they're running a bunch of comebacks. So he's got a bunch of free access comebacks, which is fine. But, you know, he threw a deep ball like he ran a post and Jaden did an excellent job layering the ball in there, made a nice catch, made a contested catch against uh, Anusium, the kid from Colorado State, who great play by Anusium, but also great play by Luke. So he's a guy that really set out in terms of like how kind of prolific his day was. Um, uh, Rosemi uh, Jack Saints. Also, is he was out there. The yeah, He had uh, the UDFA. highlight of the day. That one made it yeah. to my social media feed. Marcus Roseby, Jack Saint. Yeah. Yeah. He, you know, he had that nice one handed catch. But again, in terms of physicality, like he's a big dude. You know, I mean, he's listed at 6'2. I think he's 200 pounds, but he felt like there's certain guys when they're on the field, like a Newsium is a good example of that. Like they're just bigger than you think they are. And that's kind of how he felt. A little stiff, but I, I like, remember, I, I've said this before, I like the player quite a bit. Um, Bryson Tremaine, you know, a guy that was on the team last year, was out there, did a nice job in terms of catching the football. And then Ben uh, Ben Sinnott is a guy that, you know, it's funny, you're standing with Fred, he's wearing 82, and I think he kind of expected him to look like me. And he's like, man, he's a really good athlete. I'm like, Fred, this guy has like, he has like a 40-inch vertical jump. Like his force plate numbers are through the roof. Like, And I think that shows up. He's a little bit um, thicker than you thought, but uh, I think a guy that once you get the pads on, once we get with the varsity, once we start doing one-on-ones, I really want to see what he looks like because one of the things that I was, you know, a little bit critical of him in the process and, you know, in in my evaluation, just to be perfectly candid, is like not super short area sudden. Like he's fast. He can put his foot down down and cut. But I want to see what yeah, yeah, I want to see what he looks like when we're running some more nuanced routes and how how that skill sets develop for him. But I was impressed. He caught the ball well. He he seemed to have a really good grasp of where the offense was at. There was a sequence where. You know, there was a little bit of in, indecisiveness and he called out to the receiver and told him the route that he had. You know what I'm saying? Like it wasn't the receiver's fault. Just couldn't hear the play. And he just shouted it out to him. And I thought that guy's been in the book. He knows what's going on. So good sign. It's the first day of practice, but you know, whatever. And then um, I'm trying to think, oh, the other guy that I thought uh, looked good and we'll see how that, this per, uh, progresses is um, at the tight end spot is Yankoff, Colson Yankoff from UCLA. You know, he played running back, receiver, linebacker kind of guy, but I, I really – was surprised, you know, because there's no film on him at, from UCLA. So this is the first time seeing him move around, and he moves very, very well. And so that was kind of one of those things. You're like, oh, like this is a, this could be a nice piece, nice tool um, for the offense moving forward, especially with a guy of his size. You know, he's six four, he's two forty, kind of two thirty five, whatever he is. So uh, really was impressed by b- both tight ends, and then obviously uh, Luke McCaffrey and some of the other receivers that were there. So Yankoff's kind of in the uh, Armani Rogers like right sized athlete uh, category, or but what's, what's definitely his story? definitely way more polished. Like when uh, when Armani came to rookie minicamp, like no offense to Armani, like he played quarterback at Ohio State, right? Uh, right. Ohio, Ohio State. University of Ohio, yeah, University of Ohio. There we go, the green one, and um, <laughs> he. Um, and he uh go and he was, bobcats he was like learning how to run routes he's like learning spacing like the athletes there but yankoff actually has you can tell he's run routes before and he's pretty smooth in and out of his cuts he understands spacing he had to cut a nice ball up the seam and you're like 
this could be like kind of in the same way where you got that one year where it was like, um, you know, Curtis Hodges and Armani came in together. Like this kind of feels like it could be that same thing. I don't want to overhype Yankov just yet, but I was, I came out just being like, Oh, like, look at this dude. He looks like a, a varsity football player, so to speak. And um, again, he moved well, caught the ball. Well, he had nice bend, good sinking out of cuts. I think it'll be interesting to see what they do with him. But in terms of, I think Armani is a good comp, but just think about Armani if he was, maybe a little bit less twitchy, but further along in terms of route running and kind of nuances of the position. Yeah, no, that's that's definitely good intel. And the last thing, just quickly on, on kind of all of this, you mentioned the, hey, that guy looks like a varsity football player. That's always an interesting thing to me when guys get in camp or like when I watch other teams week one or in the preseason, yeah. you know, you have guys that looked huge in college and all of a sudden they get out there and you're like, what does he look like in an NFL uniform? And like, not that this was unexpected, but when Bryce Young put on an NFL uniform last year, you're like, oh my God, he's so small. Like that is a tiny, tiny, tiny little man uh, by NFL standards, right? But like these guys looking the part and the fact that they just jumps off to you as a guy who was around the NFL for 10 years as a player and has continued around it in the media capacity for the last five, like the fact that you're looking at Dominique Campton and Jordan McGinn, you're like, that's a big mamma jamma. Like yeah. that is, that to me speaks to something with Adam Peters and the way that he builds football teams of he wants big physical teams that beat the hell out of you. And like, we think of the stats with the 49ers it was two years ago that nobody played the 49ers and won the next week. And like mm -hmm. that, that kind of, it's going to be terrible to play the Washington commanders because they're going to, they're going to beat you up and bruise you on top of hopefully being fast and good schematically and executing at a high level, but at the very least they're big and they're physical and they're going to beat you up like that. Yeah, that I, The fact that this is the first impression I think is something that's worth noting. So thus I am noting it. Yeah. I think it's a good note, but obviously they got to get out there and grow and evolve and develop as football players. But in terms of physical stature and movement, and I think we're saying the same thing. I'm not trying to, but I'm just trying to make yeah. it clear. Like it's exciting. They've got these pieces that that looked the part, that moved well, did some good stuff. And then uh, – but they got to do it. You know, I think that's why right. this practice coming up on Tuesday is going to be so fun to watch because it's like, you know, how do they look with, with the other big guys, the other big, fast, athletic dudes, you know? And um, that's that's going to be a lot of fun. So, um, yeah, I think I came away just great energy, you know, from the offense in general. Very sharp day. I don't think I saw a drop ball. You know what I mean? Like it was very clean. Speaks to the quarterback, Sam Hartman as well. You know, throwing nice catchable footballs and knowing where they need to go with the ball. So um, really solid day for the offense. And obviously the standouts I mentioned, but, you know, Luke McCaffrey probably I'd say was the offensive MVP of the first day. And again, it's 10, 15 plays, not a lot to derive from there. But it, like to your point, like it was good to just kind of check some boxes for those guys. And obviously it's an ongoing process, but looking forward to kind of seeing that develop. All right, the guy that wasn't out there was Johnny Newton, the second round pick who had had a Jones fracture in the middle of or early last year, played through it. They found out in the medical throughout the process that he had one in the other foot as well, and he's opted to get surgery now in hopes of being ready as early as possible, uh, you know, with the season uh, around the corner. So this is obviously like the hope is he's ready for training camp and, and all, all goes well there as far as I know. Um, but he is now going to miss the off season and his first off season. Uh, and, and we're talking about how essential this is. And we're going to talk more about it, uh, in a second of the learning curve coming out of the, mm. out of college into the pros, your first, uh, exposure being in this much more controlled setting versus training camp where it's like, all right, we've tipped, we've ratcheted up a, a notch and, and it's on. Um, how significant is this for Johnny Newton's development? You know, I, I don't, I, I'm asking that and it's just to be clear to the audience. I'm asking that in an honest way. I'm not asking that in a way it's like, oh, he's screwed now, Logan. Tell us how screwed he is. But like, yeah. you know, you were a rookie once. How, how, how far behind does this put you? And then, you know, what does he have to do to, to make up that ground? Well, first off, it, it gets me excited that he played like the entire year with like two Jones fractures. Like this good dude's tough. And like if he still looked that explosive with two broken feet, like right, and he you. was playing too many snaps and the whole deal. Yeah, like so. Like how good is he actually? This I guy's going to be pretty find good out. football. Yeah. So yeah. obviously, it, it can be challenging. I think you know it'll be interesting actually to see how they handle the off season here. But one of the things that when I was younger, um, that the off season was a great kind of ramp up into. You know, it was like OTAs, we're a certain speed, mini camp a little bit faster, 
uh, you know, training camp, preseason, first game, right? And it kind of was this nice gradual buildup. <clears throat> and so one of the things that I noticed when people would miss, you know, off season, because it would happen, even guys that were really experienced, they'd come in and they'd take a couple of days, you know, sometimes a week, even veterans to kind of like get their feet under them, understand the tempo, understand the physicality. And obviously when you're older, you've gone through a bunch of off seasons, so you're okay. But I remember, you know, like Trent Williams would miss a couple of days for whatever reason and come in and look a little off. His timing was a little bit off and eventually figure it out. I think that for Johnny's going to be tough because like this is his first training camp. It's his first time going against NFL offensive linemen, first time getting NFL techniques, all that kind of stuff. Um, so it, it'll be tough. I, you know, defensively, I think you feel slightly more comfortable about it because, um, you know, it's it tends not to be quite the same mental load. And I think it's also a good testament to him that he's here. Like he was on the field. He didn't leave the field. He's in a walking boot the whole time. He's listening to the techniques. He's getting understanding of what they want. I've heard on John Kimes' podcast, actually, that, you know, he's a very fastidious note taker. He's a great student. That'll serve him well here. So, like, how many mental reps can you get? How much can you kind of embed in the offense so that when you – or defense so that when you come back, it's not this crazy jarring thing. The only thing that's jarring is the tempo. Like, you know what's going on. So, and, again, Jones fractured. Like, I know it's a big deal. You break your foot. I've done that twice. I know I've done it once. And the rehab is – pretty straightforward you know what i mean it's like you get the screw in you let the bone heal it's like six weeks eight weeks depending on what what they're looking at here so it's not like this crazy long stretch i know people have been making the comparison to big phil and what happened to him like think about big phil missed a year this guy's gonna miss you know maybe two and a half months potentially so uh, i don't think it's quite the same level of uh of impact here yeah, and as we're about to talk about in a second, like you install stuff multiple times. Your day one install yeah. gets installed like three or four times throughout, uh, you 100%. know, off season into before the the regular season. And as you said, the mental load of a defensive tackle, especially, is just so much lower than even a coverage player defensively. Yeah, because um, there's only so many fronts, so many, and not not that it's easy. Uh, not by any stretch. Like there, no. there's still a lot to learn. But the the load, relatively speaking, if I was going to pick a position for this to happen. Uh, in terms of what we're talking about here, this would be the position where I'd say you're you're left uh, least far behind. As you said, the tempo, uh, the technical proficiency, because you're missing reps on the techniques. Um, but ultimately, it's it's a huge bummer, but not anything where I think uh, it dampens either of our. Uh, I don't want to use the word expectations because it, it, that feels it's, like it's putting pressure. Excitement, but, it's yeah, excitement, excitement but like our our what we think he'll be uh, right. this year and and certainly in the long term. Maybe it, maybe he's a little less productive as a rookie because he gets off to a little bit of a slow start, but right. um, all in all, like not a not a long term knock on Johnny Newton in, in any any uh, way at all. All right, Logan, let's wrap up uh, learning the playbook. I do want to do a podcast episode soon where you you teach us a play, where you install something for us. Yeah. Uh, but instead today, because uh, we didn't we didn't plan that ahead of time, uh, we'll just we'll just talk about generally kind of what goes into this time of the year. What's happening in the classroom? What's happening on the field? Like what percent of the offense is it? And how hard is that transition from college to the pros, you've obviously done this. You've also, I, th I think the interesting comparison too that I would ask you about specific to like the rookies versus some of these vets that we're talking about last weekend versus this week is like how big is the difference when you're going from college to pro versus team to team, system mm. to system. Um, so what is this type of time of year like and like what is actually happening? Take us through a day if you can of of an NFL player in uh, in May. Yeah. So, uh, you know, essentially like what they are probably going to do, and, and this is an assumption is they're going to go through their installs in conjunction with the OTA schedule. So it'll be like the first practice will be day one install. The second practice will be day two. Third practice will be day three. You'll take a little break. Next time you kind of do a day of review on those installs. So OTA number two, review the installs, go five, six, <clears throat> five and six. The next time is a review of all of that information, then seven and eight. And they'll probably throw a red zone and short yardage in there somewhere. But it usually is an eight to 10 day install to get the whole offense in. And then they'll do the whole thing over at mini camp. They'll start, you know, one, two, three. That'll be the first day, four, five, six, second day. And then the third day will be a review usually, depending on what they think the team can handle and what's going on. It might be different because it's a new offensive coordinator, defensive coordinator. But um, for colleges, you know, like when I came out of UCLA, like we ran – a West Coast pro style. You know, we ran, uh, you know, the fullback and a tight end. And 
I had been through, let me think, um, two different offensive coordinators and a bunch of different position coaches at UCLA. So I had kind of learned how to deal with different terminology and different language. So when I got to the NFL, it was it was challenging because the volume is so much more. Like in, in college, you're always negotiating like what the kids can handle because they're they're in school. They've got a lot of stuff going on. And also when you were in school, there was the 20-hour rule or whatever Correct. That, that was. Yeah. So there was like literally a limit on time. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, you're negotiating that, but you know, like when I first got to the NFL, I was kind of blown away by the total volume and then what they were asking us to do. Like I remember being shook. I remember I had a mental mistake, my f- third or fourth OTA where it was like, it was a play where it was like, check with the quarterback. So it was like, here's the play, here's the first play. And if we get this look, we're going to check to this play. And I didn't, I didn't know the second play. You know what I'm saying? Like I, I just like tuned out in the huddle because I would heard the first one, didn't hear the second one. So there's, that now that's very common, but like at the time that was something new to me. I wasn't, wasn't ready for that. So, um, for, for me, it wasn't that big of a jump, but obviously there is a jump. And I will say now, you know, I do a lot of consulting with my, uh, my agents guys that he gets in the draft every year. And one of the big things is just how different college offenses are now, just how different the verbiage is, just how limited the verbiage is. And so when you get to a system, I don't know what Cliff's verbiage is like, you know, he's from the, um, kind of the uh, the air raid system, which is notoriously light on verbiage, but um, like if you go to Kyle, for example, like a play a, a play in UCLA's offense right now, or under uh, Chip Kelly, is literally one word. It's like rip. So that tells you the protection, tells you the formation, tells you the route concept. That is not how West Coast offenses do it. So you now have a formational tag, you have a protection tag, you have a play tag, and some people say, oh, that, well, that should make it easier. It does not because that gives you so much more flexibility from a formation standpoint. So now instead of having one formation that the route is tied to, like, for example, you know, like why sticks or stick spacing is like day one install stuff. You get a card, you get a sheet with like that's gridded off into six different boxes, right? So stick spacing is a flat and an out and then over the ball and a pivot, like an eight yard pivot. The thing is those eight boxes on that page and the next page afterward, the next probably there's probably 14 pictures total are all different formations and all different ways to tag the route concepts within those formations. So instead of now having to learn rip, you now have to learn 14 different variations. Rip one through rip 14. Correct. And so that can be very, very challenging and very, very overwhelming for young players and a good coach, a good, a, a coach that's good at, good at installing understands that. And will kind of truncate that. Hey, we're doing pictures one through four today, guys. So let's calm down. Don't worry about those other ones. We'll get there at some point. But, um, but I think that's the thing that I see it, with young guys coming out now is like, it is a, a verb. Like I think about LSU's offense, like and what Jane's going to have to go through and what, what, what that looks like here is, um, you know, obviously, uh, he was a very simplistic offense as well, kind of one or two words from what I understand. And again, it might not be that big of a jump for Cliff because Cliff is a, has a college background. So the language might be different. I should probably have a conversation with him about that, but, um, it's definitely a lot. And the, the, the responsibilities of the position are more because you have more time to study and develop, uh, and develop kind of answers to stuff as an offensive coordinator. Yeah, no, I, I think it's so fascinating and just like the intensity of it feels. I mean, I get it feels like for like to an outsider, like it it's damn near impossible. But I guess if that you're a football player, like that's what you've been doing your whole life is like you learned how you learn and you probably whether it's flashcards or whether it's you know, saying plays to your your roommate who you're staying at the hotel with, or like you have ways that you've you've had to do it and, and you understand your responsibilities. When we talk about like day one install though, how many plays are we talking here? Is that is that 10 plays? Is it 40 plays? Like what is what is the depth of day one install uh, or day two or day three? It depends. Like so I think to the lay person it might seem like there's a lot of plays in. But like for with Kyle, for example, like we would run, let's just take a simple run. So like we'd take like um yeah, outside zone 18, like it was what we called it. 18 was the number. And uh, so that just means the backs run of the outside leg of the tight end. And so you think, oh, that's pretty straightforward. You run that, but you can run that out of solo. You can run that out of split. You can run that out of all these different formations. So it looks like you're running all these different runs. But in actuality, it's the same run, just out of a bunch of different formations. So I think the hardest thing is not the total play volume. So you probably have three, four runs in, maybe five runs, and then six, seven passes, like nothing crazy. The, the the challenge comes with the variations. 
You know, like you could say, hey, Logan, drop. Like I still remember plays from when I was with Kyle. The problem is like, oh, what is the formations? Like every once in a while, something will come across my feed on Instagram or Twitter or whatever. And it's like, or someone will send me something from Twitter because I don't have a Twitter. But, I was about to say, they don't come across for you on Twitter, except yeah. for when we send them to you. <laughs> right. But so then you look at it and you say, oh, I remember that. And then, oh, it's like, oh, that's right. He does tag that formation. Oh, no, I got to tighten my split on this. And it's like, though that the devils in though are in those details for the first couple of days. And so that's where I think um, that that is challenging for a young player. Because in college, you just kind of like line up in like like let's say uh, north right clamp line up in north right clamp but i gotta remember hey like if it's this play i gotta line up like this in north right clamp and if it's this play i might get a tag and if the back's to my side i want to make sure i'm a little bit wider because i'm in a three by one like those are the types of details that become that become a little overwhelming because it's it, it is straight memorization and it really tests your football iq well so that actually was gonna i was gonna ask then is in some ways, it feels like it'd be easier if you understood the totality of it because you then understand why you are doing things. But that also feels incredibly overwhelming to a young player. If I tell you, you can just learn what you're supposed to do or you can learn what everybody's supposed to do, you'd be like, I'm going to focus on me first and I'm just going to know that I have to run five yards and turn around and try to catch a football on this player. I have to run it out or I have to run this. I have to block that guy, whatever. But if you understand the why you're doing that through the totality of a concept over time, you're obviously going to get uh, you're, you're going to be a much more successful football player because you can understand the little nuances, why you might know when to break a rule within a play like you, you can right. be more instinctive and reactive because you understand the bigger picture. So did like how did you start? And if you started by focusing on yourself, when did you turn into the I'm going to learn the entire offense guy? So basically it started off where like, I remember I was like highlighting in my book and I think like, you know, oh, I, I got the corner, let's, let's highlight the corner. So I know what I got. And then, oh, it's at this formation. I got this. So, and I remember doing that. And then Kyle, and then I think Cooley said something to me also, but Kyle, I remember in the meeting was like, Hey guys, make sure you know the whole concept because you could line up here on this play, but you could be number one on this play, but on the next play, you're going to be number two and the route's going to be different. And I was like, that's a good point. So you really got to know the whole thing. And then I remember Cooley saying to me or, or Cooley or definitely wasn't Fred, but probably Cooley. <laughs> and um, and he was like, um, yeah, man, make sure you know the whole concept. And that was kind of overwhelming. But I was like, OK. And so it did help that. I think that was maybe the biggest accelerator to my learning the offense process was basically being like, OK, like this is this is scissors, right? It's a corner by number one. It's a little snag by number two and a post by number three. So then that way I knew if I'm motioning to a two receiver side and I'm off the ball, I now have the snag, right? So like instead of me having to learn these two separate items, I learned the same play and just was able to into it based on the rules, what we needed to do. And I think like if I was going to give advice to these guys, I'm like, learn the concepts, man. Like don't mess around with highlighting yourself in the book. That's something as I got older and I became the mentor, I was always a big advocate of like, do not highlight yourself know what the concept is, know what the spacing is, know what the rules are for everybody. And again, that's not going to happen overnight, but like make sure you have open ears when you're listening to this install, because like you're going to have to line up on the backside of this stick concept and run this thunder. Like what are your rules versus thunder versus press? It turns into a fade versus cover two. It turns into an eight yard stop, like down the list. You know what I'm saying? I actually messed that up, but you get the point, right? It's like a it's a different thing, but you know what I'm saying? Yeah, so like Kyle, that, if you're listening, he still knows his stuff. Yeah, I, I don't. Yeah, that's wrong, Kyle. Sorry. Um, <laughs> I had a stress stream the other night that I messed up something in an install recently. So it is it is coming back to me. It is football Damn. season. <laughs> Damn, that's intense. Uh, so that's really, that's really cool because, so if we go back to rip one through 14, if you will, yeah, mm -hmm. like it really is just like number one is doing this. Number two is doing this. Number three is doing this. And if you learned that as rip and then you just have to figure out where you are. Correct. Now you don't have to learn rip one through 14. One thousand percent. Cause then you're like, got Oh, I'm, I'm the motion guy this time. So that means I've got this. And then it's like, Oh, I'm actually going, I'm actually going to the stick side. Now he tagged the X on the stick. I have the flat. Great job. Me. You know what I'm saying? So instead yeah. of having to memorize each individual minutia, it's like, this is stick. Someone's got a five yard out. Someone's got a flat. Which one are you? You're not the tag guy. So you run the flat on the backside. You got spacing, which is a tag concept. So where are you in the spacing sequence? Are you on the ball? Then you're over the ball. You got a five yard over the ball. If you're off the ball, you got an eight yard stop. So it just makes everything way simpler. You can call bunch. And I got to figure out how we get to this final formation to get to a two by two to run this concept. But that is ultimately like what you're settling on is stick spacing and know it 
understand the rules for it. And then I can throw whatever formation I want at you, you know, okay, cool. And it, and it's really cool. Like when you are a young player and like stick is a two man concept, spacing, is a, spacing can be a three man concept, but in this context, it's a two man concept. And I know, Hey, it's a bunch. Someone's got to be a flat runner on that side. Like, how do I get over there? So you're ready for the motion call. You're like, Oh, there's gotta be a motion. And then there it is. And then you're the guy, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, that's when you really understand kind of what's happening at a basic level with this stuff. And then you, all of a sudden you get into the season, you get to game plan uh, oh, level yeah. stuff. And then you're like, Hey, by the way, this week we're chipping uh, DeMarcus Ware every time, Logan. So then you're like, all right, I know the play. And then you go to chip DeMarcus Ware, and then he knocks you on your ass. And you're like, ah. Yeah, well, it was like, I remember this, uh, like they, they, I used to get all these like little things each, 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 each game week. Cause they, I think Kyle, Kyle told me, he's like, we know you're going to study it and you'll remember it. And right. I was like, okay. And it was just like <laughs> straight, blessing and a curse. straight memorization. And I remember we were playing uh, Oakland, uh, the Raiders in 2013. And it was a play where I had to remember to stand up on because they didn't have a term to get me to stand up. And I remember getting in my three-point stance, being like, I got a corner on this. It was great. And I just hear Santana Moss screaming at me, Logan, Logan, you got to stand up. Logan, you got to be in a two-point because he had a choice route. So he needed me to be in a two-point to pick for him. And I was like, oh, I do, but I have my hands down. So Tana, you're screwed. And then they called timeout, not for me, but for something else The Las Vegas did. So I was able to stand up, but Tana gave me an earful for not remembering that one little detail. And I still, again, that's why you have stress streams for all these little mistakes you've made over the course of your career. That's really funny because you uh, still work with Santana. I and, do. Uh, he probably doesn't remember. He might, actually, he does remember that. He does, like, Tana's got does great- Does he let you know about it every, every once in a while? Every once in a while, yeah. Like, oh, oh, yeah, yeah you're the smart right, guy on the show. Uh, remember yeah, when right. you didn't stand up? Yeah, it's always tough, but you know, hey. We're, yeah. we're learning something new every day, so. It's all right. Uh, I think you did all right. I think he did all right. I think we're doing just fine. We're doing uh, just fine. That's it, and that's all for this edition of Take Command. Thanks so much for listening. We will have uh, first impressions of the group in total uh, coming up later in the week. Minicamp uh, is open one day a week to the media, so we will talk about it, obviously, each week. We also have something really cool. I don't think we're quite ready to tell everybody yeah, what it is yet, what uh, but we, we have something really cool that the commanders have done that the people who did it are going to talk to us about uh, coming up later in the week. It is a, a football-adjacent thing, not like a, a marketing or whatever, <laughs> uh, but it's something very, very cool that we're going to hopefully uh, have later this week, if not early next week, so stay tuned for that. Very... Uh, nebulous and very uh, not transparent thing that I just told you is coming. Anyway, thanks for listening. Subscribe if you haven't. That's Logan. I'm Craig. And we'll see you next time on Take Command. Thanks for watching this clip of Take Command, which has a brand new home. That's right. You can watch on YouTube at the Team 980. You can also listen to full episodes in the free Odyssey app, which is now enabled with Apple CarPlay. So we'll just, you know, follow you around. <laughs>